All right, I think we're online. Uh, welcome everyone to Seating Labs. This is our webinar for the 2016 applications to instrumental access. Um, I'm Melissa Wu. I'm Christina Villalister Bostova. Um, and for the majority of this webinar, we're actually be, uh, going to go through a PowerPoint and we'll also be um, showing you how to log in and access the application. So let us switch over to the slideshow. Sorry, that didn't quite work. All right, so for those of you who are accessing our webinar through Google, um, you can actually ask questions during the webinar through the Q&A app. Um, you can access that by um, going into the apps button and switching between the Q&A and showcase uh, links. Um, and then once you get into the Q&A app, you can click on ask a new question and type a question and we'll see it in this hangout. Um, for the rest of you who are viewing this on our webpage or through the YouTube channel, um, please send questions to application at seedinglabs.org and we'll also be fielding questions from there. All right. All right, uh, welcome to the webinar. Uh, we'll start with a little bit of background just briefly about Seeding Labs. Seeding Labs was established as a US-based nonprofit organization in 2008. Our, miss our mission is to build a world where all scientists can make life-changing discoveries because as everyone watching this webinar already knows, scientific talent is everywhere, but resources are not. Uh, instrumental Access is our flagship program. The goal is to make affordable, high-quality laboratory equipment available to universities in developing countries. Um, and to date, through Instrumental Access, we've shipped 97 tons of equipment worth about $3.4 million um, to 39 institutions in 25 countries. Uh, and we're just getting started. This year, 2016, is on track to be our biggest year ever. We're planning to make shipments to 16 new partners selected last year. Uh, to give you an overview of how instrumental access works and what our process is, our process starts with equipment donations, which we actively solicit. About half of our equipment comes from manufacturers, and the other half comes from end users, such as pharmaceutical companies. Uh, equipment and glassware that we receive can be either new or gently used. Uh, consumables are always new and in full unopened cases. Uh, we try to be very careful about what we accept. Uh, we look for surplus equipment that is likely to be of use in biology, chemistry, or related labs. Uh, we do not accept equipment that is broken, obsolete, or so highly customized that it can't easily be repurposed. Um, so all of the donated equipment comes to our warehouse where we inventory it and do functional testing as feasible in the warehouse. Uh, for some of our more sophisticated instruments, we do send them out for third-party testing as well. Um, and we can talk more about the details of how we ensure equipment quality uh, when we get further, further along into the program. So we run an annual application process to select our partners, um, and you're all a part of that. Uh, we'll say more about the details of the review and vetting process later in the webinar. Um, accepted participants are assigned uh, a window for equipment selection, and we have an electronic shopping cart, so when it's your turn, you may select items from our inventory to build a shipment that will meet your institution's needs. And in a few minutes, Melissa will explain a little bit more about what goes into a shipment. Once the equipment process is complete, once the equipment selection process is complete, we invoice for the program fee. And after we receive payment, the shipment is packed into a 20-foot shipping container, and we schedule the shipment. We work with our partners to make sure that we're complying with all relevant customs regulations before and after shipping. Um, our partners select what port we ship to. It's usually the nearest seaport or the most convenient one. Time in transit ranges from a few weeks to about three months, depending on distance and sailing schedules. 
Uh, once the equipment arrives, recipients oversee the customs clearance process on their end, as well as transportation of the equipment from the port and then installation and use of the equipment. Uh, a little bit about eligibility. We limit eligibility for the program to academic departments or research institutes at degree granting institutions of higher education. Um, and if you have any questions at all about whether you meet this requirement, we strongly encourage you to contact us um, at our application at cdlabs.org email address, and we'll be happy to guide you through it. Um, and we've already had some conversations like that. Uh, another requirement is that your the departments or institutes focus should be on biology, chemistry, or a related discipline. And the reason for this requirement is to ensure that our inventory is a good match for your needs. Um, so again, if you have questions about whether you meet that criterion, uh, please feel free to email us. And again, the address is application at seedinglabs.org. Uh, we will consider applications from faculties, schools, groups of departments, or other non-department entities. Uh, if there's a compelling reason, but pre-approval is required, so please email us um, if you feel that you're in that situation. We do accept applications from most low and middle income countries as defined by the World Bank, uh, with a few specific, specific exceptions. Um, and these exceptions are driven either by US export control regulations or our own internal operating constraints. Uh, please note, uh, because we get asked this a lot, that we do not accept applications from individuals or lab groups, and also we do not accept applications from hospitals, clinics, secondary schools, government labs, non-university NGOs, or for-profit companies. Uh, and finally, to give you a sense of the, the timeline for the program, um, our application portal is open from May to July. The deadline for submissions is the, it's the 29th of July, <laughs> that's in the spring, <laughs> not the 26th. Um, then the period from August to December is for our review and vetting process and for final selection of awardees. Uh, we will likely notify our new partners at the beginning of January 2017. And then the period from January to March 2017, uh, we hold detailed discussions with each of our new partners about their equipment needs. We sign a letter of agreement and we complete a background survey. And then from April 2017 to April 18, that's when our equipment selection windows are scheduled. Um, so depending on when your window is scheduled, you could get your equipment you could do the selection at the beginning of that window or towards the end. Uh, the equipment selection process itself takes about two to three weeks, uh, followed by payment of the program fee, which takes about a month usually. Um, and then immediately after, we would schedule your shipment, um, which would be at report in one to three months. Uh, and just so you know, we can work with you on scheduling your equipment selection window if you have specific constraints based on your institution's fiscal year. We would be able to schedule you towards the beginning or towards the end, um, depending on what would work best for you. Um, so we just want to pause right now um, and ask if there's any questions. Uh, again, please send them to us through the website or to application at seedinglabs.org. All right, so I'm um, going to get into what I would consider the most interesting part, which is what equipment are you getting, uh, could you get through instrumental access? Um, and so value-wise, a typical shipment is um, valued between $60,000 and $150,000. Uh, As Christina said, um, each participant is assigned a selection window um, during which they can select equipment from our available inventory. And because of that, there's no typical shipment. Um, each shipment does vary to meet individual departmental needs. Um, there are a few constraints to your selection. Um, everything must fit into a 20-foot shipping container. And what you see in the photo is an example of one of the shipments that we've sent out. 
Um, they've pulled out some of the equipment and also everything in the boxes in the back, our equipment that came in this uh, shipment. Um, again, you select uh, from the inventory during a signed window. Um, and we have additional guidelines to prevent any one participant from taking all of the most valuable items available. So for most scarce items, um, we have a, a method of making sure that the first participant who goes through our selection doesn't take up all of the scarcest items um, and that those are distributed throughout uh, the year. Um, all right. So for a more detailed look at what a sample shipment looks like, um, this is an example of a shipment um, to, I think, a health sciences lab. Um, all of our equipment in our inventory is uh, equipment that's specialized for those doing research related to chemistry or biology. So you can see in this list here, it's a lot of um, chemistry and biology related equipment. Uh, in terms of what kinds of equipment we have, we have a variety of different kinds of equipment from um, balances and pipetters to HPLCs, um, biosafety cabinets. And including various kinds of consumables like gloves, tubes, and dishes, and many types of glassware. Um, although our inventory fluctuates, participants can expect during their selection window to see a large subset of these types of equipment. Um, and again, this is an example of um, some items that went into one of our shipments that went out. You can see that there's uh, a number of larger, what we call high-impact pieces of equipment. These are typically pieces of equipment that are specialized towards very specific purposes. Um, so you see there's an HPLC, biosafety cabinet, CO2 incubator, microscope, PCR machines. Um, we also have smaller benchtop equipment, which is typical for, um, you know, most labs will need this kind regardless of their discipline. So there's thermometers, vortexers, water purification systems, balances, um, and then the consumables and glassware. Uh, one thing that I should mention is uh, we actually receive donations of equipment from both manufacturers and end users. And so uh, about 40% of the equipment that we receive is actually new. Um, and then the other percent of the equipment, the used equipment, um, we do a lot of work into ensuring that that used equipment can be used by you once you receive it. All right, so participation in instrumental access is very economical. Um, participating departments pay a program fee that helps defray some of seeding labs costs. This fee is adjusted to the income level of the country where your university is located um, as uh, determined by World Bank income status. Um, as you may remember from the previous slide, these fees are just a fraction of the cost of purchasing the equipment either new or even off the used market. Um, if you remember, we have shipments that um, typically range in value between sixty and one hundred fifty thousand. So, uh, your return on your investment for the program fee is a very high return. Um, what this fee covers is all the services um, provided by seeding labs, including uh, equipment procurement storage, handling and testing the equipment, and shipping the equipment to the nearest port. Um, there are additional costs that you may incur that are not part of this program fee. Um, these costs include everything associated with customs clearance. Uh, customs clearance is your responsibility, and so these costs may include things like hiring a clearing agent. Um, other costs that you may incur include transportation of the equipment from the port of entry to your university. And lastly, any costs associated with installing and using the equipment, for example, purchasing electrical adapters, transformers, and frequency converters, um, software reagents and accessories, um, and paying for services related to installation, calibration, operating, operation and maintenance, these are all costs that um, you can expect to incur uh, through use of the equipment and are your responsibility. All right, so if you have any questions on any of those aspects, uh, please do email us at application at seedinglabs.org or use the uh, Hangouts Q&A app to ask us a question. All right. 
Um, I will talk a little bit more about our review and vetting process. Um, our review process consists of three steps. Um, first, our entire seating lab staff reads all of the applications um, and we're screening for eligibility and suitability for our program as well as overall application quality. Um, and then we typically send about half of the applications on for external review. Uh, we have at least three external reviewers read each application. Last year it was actually quite a few more. <laughs> it was more like six per application. Um, our reviewers are all volunteers. Most are research scientists, a few are international development experts. Um, and our, we ask our reviewers to score each application according to three criteria. One is the, the case you've made for need uh, for equipment. The second and most highly weighted one is the likelihood of productive use of the equipment. And the third is potential impact of the equipment arriving at your institution. Um, our top candidates coming out of external review are then invited to participate in an interview via Skype uh, or telephone if Skype isn't feasible. Uh, during these interviews, we may ask a few follow-up questions if the reviewers have raised any questions about your application. Uh, but the, the majority of the interviews are a two-way conversation about sort of the details of program participation and what, would, you know, what we would be able to provide and what would be required of our partners. Uh, we do ask um, that the university vice chancellor or an equivalent official from the administration participate in the first few minutes of the interview um, in order to confirm that the administration is supportive of the application. Uh, so that's our review and vetting process. Uh, all right, so let's talk a little bit about what we are looking for. Um, first, and most importantly, we're looking for places where additional equipment will unlock potential. Um, we're looking for places where lack of equipment is a barrier to achieving specific research and or education objectives. We're looking for places that have sufficient knowledge, infrastructure, and supporting resources to make the use of equipment that you propose feasible. Um, so that doesn't necessarily mean we're looking for the places with the most existing infrastructure, but we're looking for places uh, that we believe can do what you say you want to do with the equipment. Uh, and finally, we're looking for places where use of equipment could positively impact the university, the local community, and or the world. Uh, and then the second set of things we're looking for, we're looking for institutions that are willing and able to collaborate effectively with seeding labs on this shipment, uh, as well as comply with future obligations for reporting. So we're looking for places where there's a strong institutional and departmental support uh, for the seeding labs participation. We're looking for places that have a clear and detailed plan to distribute, install, maintain, and use the equipment. Uh, and we're looking for responsiveness and ability to meet deadlines before and after the shipment, um, including required follow-up reporting. All right, a few tips uh, for how to apply. The most important one that, that's in red on the slide um, and <laughs> is we need all of our applicants to answer all of the questions, including all of the subparts, as completely as possible. Um, our reviewers do not respond well to incomplete answers, uh, both because they don't have the information that they need and also because it doesn't reflect well on the applicant's ability to follow directions. Um, so it, it, may, <laughs> it may seem obvious, but this is the most important thing I can tell you. Make sure you answer all of the questions. Um, some other tips, do include as much detail as possible, including examples. Um, our reviewers really respond well to examples. Um, tell a consistent story with respect to your case for need, the equipment that you request, and your proposals for how to use the equipment. Um, we've received a lot of applications in the past where, where these things don't match at all, um, and that does not impress the reviewers. Um, and finally, do not focus your entire application around one instrument. Um, and especially don't focus it around something like a DNA sequencer or a mass spec, um, which we may or may not be able to provide. What we're really looking for are departments that could use what we have to offer, which is an entire 20-foot shipping container full of equipment, not just one instrument. 
Um, and finally, it's always a good idea to have a colleague review your application, because um, more eyes are always better than one. Okay, so a little bit about how to apply. Applications are typically submitted by a faculty member or department head on behalf of the entire department. Um, they must be in English except for the letters of support, which can be in any language, but we ask that you provide an English uh, translation. And you must apply using the application portal, um, which we will demonstrate for you in just a minute. Uh, the URL is on the slide and also in the request for applications. And one important note about the portal, um, it requires the use of the current version of Chrome, Firefox, Safari, or Internet Explorer as your browser. Uh, we're told that, that bad things will happen if you use a different browser. Apparently, it won't save the information and it will cause problems. Uh, so please, please stick with a current browser uh, when you fill out the application. All right, we want to pause again and remind everyone that we are very happy to answer questions if you have any. Uh, please ask through Google Hangouts or send us an email at application at seedinglabs.org. All right, so the next thing that we'll do is go through a demonstration of how to use our application portal. So we'll show you how to create a new account. Um, how to navigate through the different app, uh, sections of the application form. Um, how to work offline. How to return to a saved application. And finally, how to submit your application. All right. Um, so I'm going to switch over to our uh, internet screen, which is here. Hold on a sec while we just try and pull this up. Sorry about that. Okay. All right, so once you go to our website, you'll see that there's a link to apply um, to Instrumental Access or the application portal, and it will bring you to this page. Um, so if you haven't created a new, uh, new account yet, that's the first thing that you'll need to do. So you'll see at the bottom, there's a button uh, called Create New Account. So you just click on it. Um, and then you go through and enter the information as it asks. One of the important things to do, um, and this helps us, is with the university and department name, please follow the convention that we have up top, which is to write your university, put in a hyphen, and then put in your department name. Um, and then it goes through to ask information about you, uh, your personal contact information, and um, after you enter this in, it'll go through and put in your uh, institutional information. Let's go down. Um, one thing is all of the fields that are required have a little star next to them. Um, if you don't fill it in, it will prompt you to fill it in before um, accepting the information. Um, so for the purposes of this demonstration, we're just sort of typing in uh, some quick stuff. Uh, but you can see if, you, if everything's entered in correctly, you go to next step. It'll ask you for your password. So at this point, you can create a password to use. Um, and then finish. Um, oh, so oh, in that case, we already, used, we already used that login, so um, 
So the last thing that will happen during registration is you can choose to receive a confirmation email. Um, the system will automatically send uh, an email. Uh, this helps to make sure that when you typed in your email address, you actually put in the right email address. So we recommend you do check your email and make sure that you've received it before moving on. Um, but in this case, we'll continue without checking uh, the email. All right. So once you do that, you're now inside our portal. Um, and to access the application, you can see that there's on the front page, 2016 Instrumental Access Application, and a big blue button that says Apply. So you can click on it to apply. You could also, if you clicked on this button in the sidebar, it would do exactly the same thing. Yep. All right. So you'll see here that this is actually the application. Um, each of the sections of the application are highlighted, um, kind of in this, are, are titled in this gray. And if you click on that header, you can close each section. Um, so this way you can use to kind of easily see the different sections, open and close uh, each of them, and work on them as you, uh, you know, in the order that you want to. Um, as you're working on the application, all of the, all of the um, questions have a text box. You can fill in that question box, uh, question box uh, with your answers. And as you're working on it, don't forget the important step of saving your application, which is at the very bottom of the application, there's a button that says Save Application. Um, so remember to click that periodically as you're working on it so you don't lose any of your work. Um, if you want to see the questions, Offline, you can go to the very top of the application. Um, there is a button called uh, Question List, which will um, download your applications or download the questions as a PDF that you can view offline um, and distribute with colleagues if you need. And I believe there, so if we have, I think if we save it. Um, so once you've saved an application, you also have an application packet button next to the, the question list. If you click on the question list, it's just the questions. The application packet button will give you the questions and any answers you've filled in so far. All right. So once you've done that, um, you, of course, can return to your application. Um, if you're returning and coming back, you would typically be put into the applicant dashboard page um, when you log in a second time. Make sure to return to your application that you go down to the Edit Application button. And at this point, if you've already started the application, don't click on the Apply button on the sideboard uh, because that will start a new application. Um, so when coming back, remember just to uh, go to the dashboard and find your application at the bottom, click Edit Application. All right, so if we are coming back and editing the application, uh, once you're finished with everything, again, um, scroll down to the very bottom of the application and click Submit Application. Which is pretty far down. <laughs> <laughs> All the way at the bottom. So that's the submit button. If you submit by accident, uh, don't worry. We can undo it. Just email us at application at seedinglabs.org and ask us to undo it, and we will. Yep. Um, and in addition, you should receive an automated confirmation from the website um, that your application has been submitted. And once that's done, um, you don't need to do anything else. A couple of questions that have come in via email. Um, let me try to address them. One of them, uh, uh, one of our participants wants to know whether every applicant pays the fee or only the winners. It's certainly, it's only the winners. <laughs> um, 
Applying is free. All we ask you to do during the application phase is commit to, it. if you were chosen to participate, you would be willing and able to pay the fee. Um, and that's actually one of the things that we do ask for during the application is that um, we kind of mentioned needing support of the administration. One of the pieces of support from the administration is a letter from them saying that um, if they were, if your department was accepted into the program, that the institution would be willing to pay the program fee. Right. But absolutely, we, we don't charge anything um, until you are accepted into the program. And in fact, we do not invoice for the fee until you've had a chance to select your equipment. So you would know exactly what you were getting. Um, and that you and your institution would have a chance to make sure that the shipment meets your needs uh, before we would ever ask you to pay. Uh, okay, another question we received, uh, what are the chances of winning based on the previous calls? Um, and I can't tell you exactly what, I can tell you that last year we received, I believe, 67 applications submitted and we selected 16 winners. Um, I, I can't tell you how many applications we'll receive this year, uh, but I can tell you that we are anticipating making at least 10 awards, um, and it, it could be more. Um, so I, I hope that helps a little bit. Uh, are there any other questions? Um, there is a little bit of a delay that we've noticed between us asking for questions and receiving them, so we'll wait a little bit. Um, if you do have questions that we haven't addressed, remember that you can go to, um, you can email us at application.seedinglabs.org. We also have an FAQ section on our webpage. Um, you can view it from the RFA. Um, and let me see if I can bring it up for you. Uh, that does have a lot of commonly asked questions. Um, let's see. Let's see. All right, so let me just uh, screen share this with you. <coughs> so this is our RFA that's um, on our website at studentlabs.org, uh, RFA 2016. I imagine if you're watching this webinar, you've already uh, seen this page. Um, and if you look on the sidebar here, there's a sort of a table of contents that brings you to different sections of our RFA. Um, and there's also a link to FAQs, uh, which will bring you to the FAQ section of our um, of the request for applications for instrumental access. Um, if we see that there's a number of questions that are asked. Um, we will that are, you know pertain to the general um, applicant pool. Then we will update this FAQ section, um, and you can open and close individual questions by just clicking on them. All right. So that's our web page uh, with some common questions. All right, I think we'll just leave this up for a little while um, and give a little time for the, the delay to catch up. Um, and again, please uh, don't hesitate to ask us any questions if you have them. Um, you can ask during the webinar. Once the webinar ends, please feel free to email any questions you might have to application at cdlabs.org. Um, and as Melissa mentioned, our website does contain answers to many of our frequently asked questions.
Uh, we'll give it another uh, few minutes as we wait um, and see if there's any questions from anyone. Um, Oh, actually, one question that we've gotten um, a couple of times is, can multiple departments from the same institution apply? Um, and the answer is yes. You can apply uh, multiple institutions or multiple departments from the same institution can apply separately. Um, they would be evaluated separately. And if both departments were accepted, then uh, both would have to pay the program fee, um, but they would also both get a separate shipping container uh, specifically for each department. Right. Um, it may also be possible for departments to apply jointly, uh, but that requires pre-approval. Um, and we, we would want to hear your reasons for why uh, you would want to apply multiple departments as opposed to individual departments. All right, I think we're going to give it just one more minute here. Um, but thank you, everybody, for participating in the webinar. Um, we very much look forward to receiving your applications. Uh, they're really interesting to me. <laughs> Doesn't look like there's any more questions. All right. All right. Thanks very much. Thanks, um, everyone. Have a good day, everyone, or evening, depending on where you are.